the people that we now sensationalize think that are bartending heroes, they, they were just people. Also very easy, you know, to fall into a box that is just filled with these fake idols. Going fucking crazy, because now they're like flying around the world. And you go like, okay, that's the door. Through the door is the street, and in the street is you. Fuck off. Welcome to another episode of Bar Talks, partnered with Three Cents uh, Artisanal Beverages, and apparently only my friends from Tequila Brands <laughs> or who work with Tequila Brands. All things agave. I'm here today with Jorge Balbontin, um, or as his Facebook name goes, The Pig. Contrary to how good he looks, he's old as fuck. Cool, cheers. Uh, cheers, salut my friend. Perfect. Looks good. That is a tasty bit. But you have brought a special, special bottle. Yeah, I did. I mean, I cut it short. I always love the work of uh, Carlos Camarena. Everything that he does to me is one of the best expressions of what tequila should taste like, especially nowadays when you have so many confusions, variations and representations of what tequila is trying to uh, portray in terms of, you know, celebrity tequilas and, you know, uh, Uves charcoal filter tequilas with vanilla elements and stuff like that. Carlos has always been an agave guy, agave forward guy. And one of the products that he, one of the brands that he has is Tequila Ocho. I don't work for them. I just drink them proudly. And uh, they did a thing called uh, puntas, which essentially is letting a little bit of the heads of the distillation pretty much like it happens in the world of mezcal, being part of the final product, giving a whole new angle to the taste profile of the tequila, having a little bit more of acidity, if you might, which is very, very unique. And it's, this is an overproof. This is 106 proof uh, tequila, Blanco, no aging. And it's it doesn't fantastic. Taste like it doesn't like taste it. like 106. But I think there's a bunch of things that I want to ask you. And the first thing is, you are the first kind of ch chili, like Latin and Latino that I met from way back then. This is 2012, 13. You see, a funny thing, I think that uh, there is always at least one chili in the room. Not in the room, but not necessarily, but it could be in a country, you know, like in a, any profession, in anything that you go around. And we are only 13 million people, so it's a very small country mm. if you think about it. Now, in the world of bartending, bar bartending in general in Latin America has been a little bit behind, you know, it's now catching up with all technology and social media and whatnot. But I'll say humbly, yet proudly, that I was probably within reason, one of the first ones of my generation to go and start a serious career in bartending. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just doing the job for the summer. Although, like the majority of the people probably out there, at the very beginning, I didn't know how long this is going to last. I didn't know if it's going to be something that it will last for my entire career or professional career. So when I arrived to Europe, I did have some knowledge in terms of drinks, drinking for sure, uh, and mixing drinks and whatnot. I did have some experience of working in bars, pubs, and, and et cetera, back in Chile. But I was very far from the level of bartending that Europe had at the time. Mm -hmm. you know, my first blog. What, yep. what year was this? This is 2000 on the spot. I think oh, I wow. arrived here on the 3rd or 4th of two, uh, January 2000. So 23. Eh? 23 years old. 23 years ago. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And when I arrived, ah, I arrived. Double, double, double. I, <laughs> I arrived to Barcelona, here where we are today. I only spent a couple of months, then I got offered a possibility to go to Mallorca, to the most fancy place ever, which is called Magaluf. So I arrived there, you know, I started working as a glass collector, bar back, etc. And then I made my way up and started making some drinks. Um, I thought I had learned quite a bit. Uh, although the place was like a little cruise ship shed show uh, all together just in a bar. Island. Island drinks and holidays, like pre-packed holidays kind of thing. And then almost coincidentally, I didn't wasn't properly as planned, I end up going to London and deciding to stay in London. And once I arrived to London and I started going to bars, I realized that I did not know much about it. So I shut the fuck up and I decided to start listening rather than talking and start learning. And I was very lucky because that was 2002, 2000, almost 2003. 
And that was what we now, looking back, the old timers like myself, you know, we start denominating as, you know, the second golden age of bartending. You know, the early 2000s in London, it was when, you know, things are starting to happen in a different way. It wasn't just the bartending style of, you know, the little bow tie and, you know, one hand like this, one hand like that, hotel service. We were talking about, you know, people like, for example, the people from Lab, right, that they start doing, you know, the double pouring, you know, the cut, you know, that kind of bartending experience that it was much more visual and engaging and they were much more going towards homemade ingredients. They didn't have the technology that we have today, for sure. We didn't have the technology that we had today, for yeah. sure. But it was the eagerness on, you know, being a bartender as an advocate and interested person on its science part of things what's happening behind things to then produce a drink. And that was the first time ever. When and you, I was there. Well, what year was this? This is 2002, 2003, 2004, and then the next four or five years. Okay, so 2000, like, we're just, just for timeline, yeah. 2002 to like 2007 or whatever. For those of you, for those of us who just started bartending, it's all cool and new when it's here. But 2002, that was not a thing, right? You, Sorry. you, you, there was no WhatsApp group where a flyer could get posted. Absolutely. There was no, nothing like this, right? I will explain it in a different way. I mean, we, um, and this might sound very dinosaur-like, but um, we, I'm part of a generation that we were the last generation to go from analog to digital. Mm -hmm. And that's quite a thing, right? I live both. You know, I live in a world where, you know, technology in the digital world, in the immediate, you know, immediateness of, you know, you and I talking to each other, doesn't matter where you are in the world, you know, it was almost impossible, right? to a world where now, as you very well explained, we have all of the things that you just mentioned before to the point of artificial intelligence, you know, being a mediator, you know, between us one way or another, or exposing ourselves through artificial intelligence, you know, that it is a representation of something, you know, which okay. is mind fucking, you know, it's, 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 it's mind blowing, you know, it's, it's something completely crazy. But now what happened with that, and it's, this is something that I, I am actually proud that to have lived that moment, it was that among other things, because technology and the reach to information it was so orchestrated and so difficult in those days, you had to actually go out and meet people. It was a thing. Oh, you weren't staring at, a, at an iPhone every day. <laughs> exactly. Hi. You, know, you wanted to learn more? You needed to go to that bar to find out how they were doing. And you, you had to ask that bartender. You, you have an event. You needed to go and yeah. talk to that bartender and follow him, not follow him in Instagram, follow him to his event to then see what he was doing. What was different? from what you were doing and what he was doing or she was doing, you know, and how could you learn that technique or not? You know, I think that feeling of belonging that we all have, you know, these so-called urban tribes and whatnot, that everybody wants to belong to something or yeah, be yeah. recognized and they're, you know, I'm not going to get into pronoun things, but, you know, the whole thing about, you know, being part of. At the time, in our little urban tribe community of bartenders that it didn't have to do with the fact of where you were coming from. Imagine me, Chilean in London, you know, how the fuck did I got there in the first place? You know, I was probably the only Chilean around in that culture or subculture called bartending, you know, but I was being part of something, you know, and people were, were being very welcoming to me in terms of like, okay, you're interested in this, what you need, what you want, just the recipe? You want the technique? You want to know how do I go to this idea? You will have to actually engage to that person, break the ice to gain their trust, to then have a conversation, which normally was surrounded by drinks, yeah. right? And then go, dude, this is super cool. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you did it. Why did you leave Chile? Like what was the, you know, because you're a dinosaur, so whatever reason you had for doing that, would be something that would be refreshing to say. I knew that the world was bigger to what I could see, to where my eyes I could reach. I knew that the world was a bigger place. And I already, I didn't see everything in Chile, but for sure I saw everything in my little hometown, which is 1,200 kilometers away from Santiago. It's a small place, 100,000 inhabitants. I knew that it was more, much more to it. You know, did I know that I wanted to be a bartender or be related to the drink industry? Fuck no. Did I know exactly what I wanted to be? Fuck no either. You know, I didn't know, you know, I wanted to be like everybody else, you know, part astronaut, part, you know, cinema, filmmaker, director, or something around those lines. You know, I did like art, I did like philosophy, you know, but I didn't know how to place all that together, all of my inquiries, all of my ideas into one thing. Then there are certain things that for sure I chose 
and I took a decision and I said no more of this but more of this other thing and that started building into what it is today a career for sure. Now what happened in London is, 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 is something that I think is quite unique. I always felt that London beyond the obvious that you know being a capital of the world in the drink industry and whatnot which I pretty much agree I think London has a very beautiful thing and you cannot generalize on 100% on anything which is more often than not you will go out in London and the first question will not be where are you from. The first question will be other things. What are you into? What are you doing here? When did you arrive? Are you hanging around by yourself? Other things. But in many other places in the world, I find that, you know, uh, um, to a certain extent, that the first question that it discriminates to a, to a point or not is where are you from? you immediately being boxed into where are you from you want to be one way or the other and in london especially in the bartending community especially in those days that i was lucky enough to arrive you don't you didn't have that so you had a better feeling of belonging if you were looking towards the same direction and everyone was looking at the same direction which it was towards the unknown we didn't know where we were going with this whole thing about being bartenders. We didn't realize that was the second golden age of bartending at the time because we were living it. We were being part of it. So when you are being part of a change, you don't normally realize how transcendent, tra uh, how much is going to transcend or not. You just live in the moment and you go, oh, these are hectic moments or this is crazy or, you know, things are going a little bit out of control. Sure. But you are not experiencing that this would be part of your history or history in a, in a larger extent. One of the things that to me was very unique at the time as well is that, um, and this is a big point of difference, um, we didn't have heroes in our industry. We didn't have much people to actually follow or look up and go, wow, I want to be like that person or the other person. If you were completely a romantic and, you know, kind of a nostalgic person, then you will look into, you know, Jerry Thomas and this and the other, you know, and stuff like that. But in re the reality of it, it was that at the beginning of those early 2000s, I'm not going to say that everybody was at the same level, but nobody was being the absolute leader at the time. You know, it happened sometime where everybody was pushing their own boundaries and what they had around them and the resources that they had until some people started showing us, you know, certain uh, leadership, certain, you know, uh, going beyond the obvious thing or certain scientific approaches like the unnameable Tony Conigliaro or the crazy Nick Strange way, you know. And yes, for sure, we had, you know, the knowledge or the passion, you know, being inherited by, you know, the great Dick Brussel, but we didn't realize that Dick Brussel was this father figure for us, you know, at the time. Because it was just Dick Brussel. Because it was just Dick Brussel, because he was there and that bar. And you could go and have a drink there and it was just a guy who was a little bit older than you and then you were like cool this guy made you know vodka espresso and you know some coffee liqueur and we were like that's great but at the time that cocktail for example it was not a modern classic so no. we were not like oh wow you reinvented cocktail making because you make a modern classic and so many others mm. you know it was like this guy's making drinks cool i want to make drinks too so be, this that's... is what I'm saying when you are being part of something that you don't realize, you know, the level of transcendence that is going to have. And the definition of a hero, and I think today is actually, this is a very confusive um, subject, is that the hero normally is the representation of all the possible values that are to do with a specific culture. Now, the culture can be geographically related and you can say it's a culture that comes from this country or this city or this area or this region, or a culture can be something more nomad. In our case, in bartender, we were nomads. Even though that we were joining together, in this case, in London, we were coming from all over the world. And as I mentioned before, you know, we were not really that um, just mental in, but you're Russian, so you should be like this and the other, but you're Chilean, so you should be this and the other. It was like more like, so you're interested in making drinks. So tell me what you know. And I tell you what I have. Mm. And I show you my bar. And I go to your bar. You know, and then let's go and visit crazy fucking um, Dick Russell, you know, and talk to him. The people that we now sensationalize think that are bartending heroes, they, they were just people. I'm going to sound extremely old. I know I'm old, you know, I, I know I'm 46, but I also know that I can pull a 45, you know, that like oh, people me. can get confused and go, yeah, that's he looks that, 45, that's your so I'm all right, right? That's that, yeah, that would be my Tinder profile. 
I don't think that it's right to say that there's no heroes because this is a very subjective thing. Mm. You know, you can have your own hero that it could be a yeah. childish thing or it can be, you know, something that you know, you just something to look up, you know, whether if it's a writer or, you know, whoever it is, a, a Hollywood star. The only difference or the main difference, at least regarding our industry and our history, is that at the time, for us, the only way to have those heroes, it was to go and visit them or to try to follow somebody that knew more than you, that you will go, oh, wow, this guy is being very fucking cool. And he's coming up with really good ideas. Today, you can have as a hero somebody that you never met before, and you will follow him or her dearly. I'm very adamant and you will be like every single day seeing what is he doing now? What is the new idea? What is he telling me today? Should I follow this trend? Should I follow the other? But that is all unpersonal or the majority of it is impersonal. And it's very also, also very easy, you know, to fall into a box that is just filled with these fake idols. Are bartenders sensationalized? Because there's, there's, I'm two ways about this. Right. On one hand, the more attention the industry gets, the more likely we're going to be accepted, the more likely we're going to become normalized, the more likely we might end up getting ways to earn more cash than being always at the bottom of the ladder. Which is a good thing. Which is a good thing. Absolutely. On the other hand, there it's led to, and we've seen this years and years and years, certain people getting a certain amount of highlight going, going fucking crazy because now they're like, flying around the world. You lose rationale, you know, you, you become something that is a little bit between being shallow and just being the projection of a projection. It's very different, you know, to, and uh, it's very important, I say, to understand where is the character or the persona and what's the real person, you know, and sometimes, especially in this industry, particularly, I think, in the, in the, in the case of brand ambassadors, people tend to think, oh, that brand ambassador, he drinks all day, you know, he wakes up and probably drinks tequila like that straight from the bottle. No, he doesn't. Or maybe he does not. But there is a projection that that person has put over time, you know, that he's unbeatable, that nobody can drink more than him, that he can, you know, go until four o'clock in the morning and then be in a meeting next morning, you know, super sharp, etc., etc. You know, but that's a projection of what we are trying to show the rest of the world. Now, what I think is that it can be very confusing nowadays, the amount of PR that we are either self-imposed to ourselves or we are capable of producing, or that we are gaining from brands, corporations, media, and, you know, even competitions and whatnot. Is it good in the long run? I'll still say yes. I want to, because I want to believe as well that this is going to be good, because one thing that I think it has to yet become more normalized is that the amount of effort that the majority of the people are putting into this industry, whether if you are a professional mixologist, I hate the word, uh, or whether if you are just a hardworking person who is mixing or putting drinks, maybe you're putting Jack Daniels and Coke, hey, nothing wrong with that. If you're putting your hours and you're working really hard in a place that, you know, is making money through that, great, good on you, and you should be paid for that, not only for your spectacular knowledge of uniqueness and, you know, your garnishes that are impossible to replicate. I think it has to do with a number of factors. One of them is empiric experience. You know, you can have experience. You have, you maybe you have read a lot. Maybe you have followed, you know, the right people. Maybe you have, you know, looked into and put a number of hours, you know, on researching and understanding a number of things, you know, that they can be positive towards the development of your career. And then you can charge X, Y, or Z, depending on who you are, etc., etc. But if you haven't put the actual effort, physical effort, the physical hours to get to somewhere, I think it's a little bit unfair. You know, as a bar owner for some time, you know, I had people that they came to my bar and they will tell me in the interview number one, yeah, okay, so how much you pay? This is before actually defining, you know, what's the job or anything. And I go, well, we'll get to that, don't worry. And say, so, well, I gotta let you know that if you hire me, uh, there's gonna be at least three to five bartending competitions that I'm gonna be attending throughout the year. Most likely I will be selected in all of them. So it's gonna be a very big period of time that I'm gonna have to be traveling, but this is good for you. About. And I'm going, whoa, 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 listen, dude, I haven't even offered you a job yet. Right? And this is without discounting the fact that they, later on they will tell you, by the way, I don't chop lines, I don't clean fridges, you know, I don't do inventory. And you go like, okay, that's the door. Through the door is the street, and in the street is you. Fuck off. That's crazy. It's crazy, but this is happening. 
And I talked to friends of mine that they still bar owner, bar operators, you know, people that they are like, for example, in this bar, they have an operation that there are now seven bars altogether. So they have a big amount of people, a rotation of people that they come in asking for a job. And there is a big bunch of them that they come with those demands on day minus one. Hey, yeah, yeah, I might work in your place, but this and this and this and this and that. And you're going like, dude, relax. You know, if you get to that, cool, we'll talk about it. Mm. And I also believe that especially after pandemic, you know, it's very important and it's a good thing, you know, that people start realizing both ends, you know, bar owners and then, you know, the employees as well. They start realizing that you, it's not normal that you're getting paid, you know, m less than minimum wage and you are working 12 hours straight and you're having 10 minutes to eat a bocadillo behind the bar hidden. No, that's not normal and it shouldn't be normal. But it also cannot be that, oh my days, you know, the... Yeah. calcium on the lines you know it doesn't help my nails so i cannot work that yeah that no much. no it's funny also shout out to Juanillo and friends um i don't spend fucking enough time with marco Juanillo at all i always see them i'm asking them for favors usually and i hang out more with their bartenders but we are in bar sauvage which is a two-story bar here yeah. in the in elborn and they were essentially the kind of the ogs of Barcelona, because I remember when Elborn was not touristy. I've been here when it was still dangerous. The first time I came to yeah. Barcelona. Yeah, yeah.